Now, without first thanking you for your presence, um, the representatives of and experts for the participation, as well as my colleagues at the foundation who all together made this webinar possible. Um, let me provide you with a brief introduction and a series of technical indications before I introduce you to the moderator who will conduct the discussions. First of all, this webinar is a part of the series of over 10 to this day that the EU LAC Foundation has organized since the beginning of the pandemic with the aim to present a balance of opportunities and best practices related to topics that are relevant to the strategic partnership between the EU, Latin America and the Caribbean, especially in these extraordinary times. It is also an event embedded in the framework of the 2021 Europe Week in Hamburg, an initiative of the Senate of Hamburg, which is the host city of the foundation since its establishment in 2011. Let me now introduce our distinguished moderator, Annette Numa, who, will join, who is joining us from Tallinn, Estonia, and will conduct the upcoming sections. Please, Annette, the floor is yours. So thank you, uh, thank you a lot. And good, good afternoon and morning to everybody who has joined us today. I'm very, very happy to be moderating this panel today. And I'm sending you the warmest greetings uh, from a very sunny uh, and beautiful city of Thailand here. My name is Annette Numa, and I work as one of the digital transformation advisors at the Estonia Briefing Center, where actually our main goal is to support different countries with their digital transformation uh, process here. Uh, but now to get to the topic of the uh, today's discussion here. So we're starting a discussion on a topic on cultural policies in times of digitalization and experiences from the European Union, Latin America, and of course, also Caribbean side. And as we know, the aim of this webinar is to promote the discussion between decision makers and representatives of civil society, and of course, also on important issues of the European Union, Latin America, and Caribbean countries, and mostly share national and regional experiences in the light of best practices in a way. And we're going to dive, uh, dive deep into uh, questions on how the tendency towards uh, digitalization in both regions has had an impact on the cultural sector and specifically how it has also shaped uh, the cultural policies in different countries in, in these uh, regions. Uh, but before we are going to focus on these specific topics, as we're going to have three different sections today here, I also um, have here together with me uh, four um, experts who are going to start with their opening remarks. Um, so I would give the floor over um, to uh, Dr. Adrian Bonilla, but also a little bit about his background here. So he's the executive director of the EU LAC Foundation, and he assumed the role of ex executive director already from 2020. And before joining uh, the foundation, he was the national secretary of higher education with a ministerial rank in his country, and served also as a secretary general for the entire region at Latin American Faculty of Social Sciences. And of course, also as a director of the office in Ecuador. So uh, all the way, um, the floor is your, uh, yours, uh, Dr. Benila, and then uh, you can start with your opening remarks here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Annette. Let me switch to, to Spanish. Um, este seminario se enmarca, de, se enmarca dentro de la... Un instante. Okay. Este seminario se, se en, enmarca dentro de los objetivos de la Fundación, que es efectivamente un organismo internacional compuesto por los países eh, de América Latina y del Caribe, agrupados en la CELAG y los países de la Unión Europea. Y se enmarca además dentro de la Semana de Europa, en eh, la serie de eventos y celebraciones que desde la ciudad de Hamburgo se han planificado para, estas, uh, para, para, para estos momentos. Y por eso queremos agradecer, reiterar nuestro agradecimiento por la hospitalidad que la ciudad y el gobierno de Alemania le da a la Fundación EULAC. El objetivo de este organismo es contribuir al fortalecimiento del proceso de la asociación biregional entre los países de las dos regiones y fomentar el conocimiento y entendimiento mutuo entre las sociedades de acuerdo a los mandatos que los jefes de Estado han enunciado a lo largo de la Uh, historia de la fundación, al igual que las altas autoridades gubernamentales. El tema es importante, no solamente porque forma parte de la agenda común de América Latina, el Caribe y Europa, 
sino porque las experiencias que hemos vivido últimamente dan cuenta de un momento de la era digital que ha cambiado profundamente la forma en que vivimos e interactuamos las personas. Y esto es absolutamente evidente, sobre todo en estos casi dos años que hemos convivido, hemos socializado, nos hemos relacionado alrededor de instrumentos digitales, hemos producido conocimiento, lo hemos circulado, lo hemos diseminado, hemos vivido eh, alrededor de estos instrumentos. Y esto que ha afectado la vida de todas las personas, que ha cambiado la forma de relacionarnos de una u otra manera, al menos en su intensidad, obviamente tiene un impacto en todas las cadenas de valor y en el espacio de lo cultural también. Desde la producción de bienes culturales, de objetos y de valores y de creencias y de símbolos, hasta su distribución, su consumo. Nos plantean los problemas clásicos de todos los bienes, problemas de acceso, problemas de participación, cambios que conllevan una serie de desafíos y que eh, evocan la necesidad de construir nuevas expresiones culturales en términos de idiomas y de formas de accesibilidad. Hay importantes diferencias que probablemente las vamos a identificar alrededor de este, de este evento en el acceso países y sociedades que tienen eh, más posibilidades de acceder, pero dentro de todos los países, grupos de la sociedad que tienen más acceso y otros que lo tienen menos. Y desafíos para todos los países, para todas las sociedades, para todos los gobiernos que tienen que ver con las brechas que se originan a partir de la falta de acceso o, o de la uh, posibilidad de acceder a instrumentos y a bienes culturales en el mundo de lo digital. Eh, la asociación estratégica birregional eh, eh, depende mucho de cómo podamos nosotros concebirnos en el presente y cómo podamos proyectarnos en el futuro. Y el presente es profundamente digital ya y la cultura, que es una manera de producir valores, creencias, percepciones, emociones y conocimiento también, es, una, uh, es un ámbito que está en perpetua transformación, en perpetuo movimiento, que no es estática. De ahí la relevancia de este evento que nos eh, 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 impulsa a sostener la reflexión sobre experiencias y sobre alternativas viables en este plano, eh, mirar cómo los ámbitos de la digitalización pueden democratizarse a nivel global y pueden impulsar, acelerar eh, y volver más sólida la relación birregional, esto siempre desde la perspectiva de la fundación. Por esto es que nos planteamos una, eh, una, una agenda para este seminario que nos permita entender las dos regiones o empezar a explorarlas en este ámbito, eh, identificar las oportunidades de desafíos que tenemos por delante, las formas de hacer cultura que ciertamente han cambiado, sobre todo en los últimos dos años, identificar mejores prácticas y experiencias eh, y tratar también de eh, sistematizar eh, cuáles son los instrumentos y cuáles son las políticas eh, y, y por último producir información relevante para la toma de decisiones y para el avance de las sociedades de las dos regiones y su relación. Muchísimas gracias a todas las personas que están en este evento, a las panelistas, a los panelistas y a, a quienes han contribuido a su realización. Muchas gracias, Daniel. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bonilla. Now we're moving on uh, to the second uh, speaker here, uh, who is Claudia Kinterstorfen, and she also has a very impressive career. So she's the head of America's region, uh, regional di division at the European External Action Service uh, at Brussels, Belgium, as well as she is the head of political press and information section at the EU delegation to Uruguay. Um, so uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Annette. Uh, yes, you uh, recall the part of my CV that is already a couple of years back when I was in Uruguay, after that in Brazil. But now I'm in Brussels, as you say, and I'm here to uh, represent the European co-presidency of the EULAC Foundation. Uh, bueno, 
como siempre, realmente es un placer para mí estar en la apertura de este webinario organizado por la Fundación eh, ULAC y eh, aprovecho para eh, enviar un cordial saludo a su director ejecutivo, al doctor Adrián Bonilla, así como a los otros integrantes de este panel de apertura, eh, en particular al embajador Mauricio Escanero y a la secretaria de Estado del Senado de Hamburgo, a Albert Müller. Estamos tratando hoy un tema que es de mucha importancia, siempre ha tenido mucha importancia en la relación biregional entre la Unión Europea y América Latina y el Caribe, que es la cultura. Pero lo estamos haciendo desde una perspectiva novedosa, examinando cómo la digitización en ambas regiones ha tenido un impacto en el sector cultural y específicamente cómo ha dado forma a las políticas culturales de los diferentes países de las dos regiones. Permíteme de pasar ahora al inglés. So for our translators, I will switch to English now. So when speaking about times of uh, digitization, it is very appropriate to be speaking with you, with all of you through a screen. Previous forums that the foundation organized on cultural issues were held in cities such as Lisbon and uh, Genova, historic cities with a rich cultural heritage. But today we're here on Zoom. So this is our new reality, which has become the new normal in just a year. And it shows how quickly the hu we humans can adapt to new circumstances. And just last week, Sir Anthony Hopkins accepted his Oscar for Best Actor on a Welsh hillside instead of on stage in Hollywood. And this went almost unnoticed. What was completely unnoticed, though, was that the European Union co-funded the film, The Father, in which uh, his performance was given. And it also won the award for Best Adapted Screenplay. Another EU-funded film, Druck, Another Round, won the award for Best International Feature Film. And I've seen the uh, trailer for, for this film and uh, it seems well worth watching. Of course, the father, the father very much so too. So these are great successes and they raise uh, important questions for policymakers. So these days, who are actually our audience, our neighbors, when the world is only a click away? Digitalization may help us to share experience but it may also sharpen the tyranny of distance. And for some, the move to life online may have free time to finish their novel or their album, but for others, it has denied them the opportunity to perform, at least to live audiences, or to be paid for performing. And so the fundamental priority for both cultural policy and digitization must be to empower all our fellow citizens. Technology gives us the possibility to promote creativity and diversity of expression, but we know that it also raises concerns about homogenization and changes to a way of life. It is for this reason that the European Commission has presented earlier this year a new vision and proposals for Europe's digital transformation by 2030, called Shaping Europe's Digital Future. Um, and so the European Union wants a European society which is powered by digital solutions that are strongly rooted in our common values and that enrich the lives of all of us. So people must have the opportunity to develop personally, to choose freely and safely, to engage in society regardless of their age, gender or professional background. The three key obje objectives to ensure that digital solutions help Europe to pursue this uh, way, to, its own way towards a digital transformation that works for the benefit of people through respecting our values is a technology that works for people, a fair and competitive economy, and also an open, democratic and sustainable society. Uh, I also just want to mention an example of another area where the European uh, Commission is, is active when it comes to uh, cultural issues and uh, digitization, and that is, of course, uh, the cultural heritage. And so this uh, has really been given a new breath of life thanks to digital technologies and the Internet, because citizens now have the opportunity to access cultural material online. 
And so new technologies are bringing uh, cultural heritage sites back to life. There are virtual museums that offer visitors the possibility to see artworks residing in different places in context and experience objects or sites which are inaccessible to the public. But this is just but one example and maybe my colleague later on will, will speak about uh, some more. So uh, with uh, those words, I uh, think we have a really very uh, fascinating and interesting topic for today's seminar. And I wish all of you uh, a very interesting couple of hours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Claudia, for your interesting introduction here. Um, the third person that I'm happy to introduce here now is Mauricio Escanero, uh, who is currently um, head, of Mexic uh, head of the Mexican mission to the European Union and also the ambassador of Mexico to the Kingdom of Palchum and Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. Previously, he also served the Mexican Foreign Ministry as an advisor to the Undersecretaries of Foreign Affairs and he also served as an ambassador to South Africa, as well as the embassies of Australia, Jamaica, Japan, and also in different uh, diplomatic positions here. So the floor is yours. Muchas gracias. Eh, Dr. Adrián Bonilla, el director ejecutivo de la Fundación Neulac, y señora Claudia Gisterdorfer, copresidencia de la Unión Europea del Consejo Directivo de nuestra Fundación, y señora Almut Moller, Secretaria de Estado del Senado de Hamburgo, ciudad sede de nuestra fundación, y señora Anet Numa, moderadora de este webinario. En mi calidad de copresidencia de la CELAC, del Consejo Directivo de la Fundación EULAC, me es muy grato saludar y dar la bienvenida a todas y a todos las y los panelistas y participantes en este webinario de la Fundación EULAC, sobre las experiencias de la Unión Europea y de América Latina y el Caribe en materia de políticas culturales en el actual contexto de rápida digitalización. Este tema es de importancia clave, particularmente en el contexto del impacto de la pandemia COVID-19 en la producción, distribución y consumo de los bienes culturales. Sin duda, la pandemia ha tenido impactos en la industria creativa y al mismo tiempo ha reiterado el importante valor de la cultura para la humanidad. Hoy en día, las oportunidades que presenta la recuperación post-COVID en el ámbito de la cultura se dan en el surgimiento y el poder transformador de las tecnologías digitales, así como en la creación de nuevas propuestas y expresiones culturales en concordancia con los retos de nuestro tiempo. La Asociación Biregional CELAC Unión Europea está llamada a desempeñar un papel fundamental en esta nueva etapa de cooperación cultural entre nuestras sociedades. Me es particularmente grato constatar que este seminario se realiza con la participación de organizaciones afines como la UNESCO y otras importantes organizaciones culturales de la región de América Latina y el Caribe, así como la Comisión Europea y otros importantes actores de distintos ámbitos académicos y de la sociedad civil. Estas alianzas permiten potenciar el trabajo de la Fundación EULAC como organización internacional ya en, eh, a punto de cumplir su segundo aniversario, brindando un valor agregado para fortalecer los vínculos birregionales y el trabajo multilateral de nuestras dos regiones. Les deseo a todas y todos un provechoso webinario y aprovecho esta oportunidad para reiterar el compromiso de México para continuar fortaleciendo la Asociación Estratégica CELAC Unión Europea en apoyo a la cooperación internacional. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you so much also from my side here. And of course, last but not least here, uh, we have Almut Mella, uh, who is the State Secretary of the Senate of Hamburg. And from 2015 to 2019, she was also the head of the European Council on Foreign Relations in Berlin, and previously also the head of Alfred von Oppenheim Center for European Policy Studies at the German Council on Foreign Relations in Berlin. So we will be happy to hear about your thoughts here. 
Thank you very much, uh, dear Annette. Uh, dear Dr. Bonilla, dear Claudia Winterstorfer, Ambassador Escaniero, uh, dear Annette Luhmann, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends, it's really on behalf of the Senate of the Free and Hanseatic City of Hamburg, uh, great delight, and I thank you for inviting me to join this very important uh, seminar. Let me say, Dr. Bonilla, uh, the Senate of Hamburg is proud to host the important EOLAC Foundation and uh, the collaboration with you and your team, the partnership and friendship that we have developed. Uh, and uh, Hamburg, the Senate of Hamburg, looks to this part of the world with great interest. And so for me, it is really delightful um, that you are also placing in our Europe Week uh, some of your initiatives uh, that you're doing. And I really would like to uh, thank you for that and wish you all success uh, for this. Um, I just want to briefly address a little bit the, the subject from a Hamburgian perspective. Um, like in other places around the globe, uh, as, as you will know, Hamburg's cultural institutions have been severely hit by the pandemic. Museums, theaters, concert halls and clubs uh, have been shut down for quite some time, for months now, with the exception really of one week in March where there was a little bit of an opening. But um, with the closing of cultural institutions, an important space for societal dialogue, and react, reaction reflection has disappeared, at least temporarily in that way that we've known. And that comes at a particular time where we're all grappling with the pandemic and where arts and culture can actually help us address some of the, the grievances and the difficulties that we're facing here. So the shutdown of cultural institutions, as sad and as difficult uh, as it is, reveals their relevance to us, I think, in a, in a uh, very stark way, again, on a personal, but also on a society level. And uh, I think we all agree, we, we, we wish they can reopen soon. Yet, like most crises, and this is what I want to shed light on a little bit, um, the pandemic is also facilitating rapid change. And some of the previous speakers have addressed that. The most visible change is certainly the progress in digitalization. And uh, from a Hamburgian perspective, we can say that due to the corona-related closure of Hamburg's cultural institutions, digital forms of engagement are becoming more widespread, practiced, accepted. So these days, almost every exhibition offers digital tours, which are not only booked by a local audience, but also by visitors from all around the globe, thus enabling encounters that are impossible without digitalization. However, this certainly does not mean that digital formats can substitute the in-person experience, but they allow new forms of engagement. And I want to shed light uh, on just a couple of examples uh, here in Hamburg. Hamburg's Museum of Art, uh, the Hamburger Kunsthalle, is currently showing an exhibition of Giorgio de Rico's magical reality paintings in, additional, uh, in addition to digital tours, the museum established a cooperation with local theaters and an avant-garde orchestra. And museum, theaters, and the orchestra cooperated for the first time and produced seven videos that offer cross-border access to this artist's work, dating uh, back to the late 19th uh, and then uh, middle of the 20th century, as, as you might know. So the, the unreal deserted showrooms shown by the paintings are picked up by the actors and musicians in order to create a status of magical reality, not only by fine art, but also by drama and music. This is one example of how the pandemic opens space for interdisciplinary cooperation that would otherwise be either too difficult to forge or too expensive to produce. Another example is the project Digital Bini, led by the Hamburg Museum for Ethnology, the MARC. The museum is preparing a digital space to unite the globally dispersed works of art from the former kingdom of Benin. As an unparalleled form of knowledge, uh, this digital Benin uh, space will bring together object data and related documentation material from collections worldwide and provide the long requested overview of the artworks and the histories, cultural significances and provenances. So in my opinion, this process of digitization 
that all fields of culture are currently experiences has a number of positive effects as well. It brings together cultural partners that would not have come together without it, and it fosters interdisciplinary work. It has the potential to democratize people's access to culture. It can ensure the representation of also vulnerable groups and minorities in the cultural sphere, and thus promote diversity in culture. And last but not least, digitization and cultural policies can help strengthening bi-regional cooperation between Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean. This, uh, Dr. Bonilla, uh, dear uh, Adrian, we've discovered also over the past months in conversations together, and uh, your, um, under your leadership, the foundation has been very active in providing for that space. And I think this is a very good example of, of how we can now cross geographic borders and engage in a conversation that otherwise would have been more difficult. So the opportunities are great, but of course, several prerequisites are necessary to raise the potential, and this is what we will discuss this afternoon. To conclude, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's high time to better understand how different places are using digital means for cultural production and to learn from each other. And in this regard, uh, today's event, uh, I think, is of, of high relevance. We as a city are looking forward to learning from Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as from our European partners. So greetings also to Tallinn, uh, Annette, and uh, to other Europeans who might be in the webinar today. And we are eager really to learn and to see what, how the pandemic facilitated uh, learning in the cultural sector elsewhere and how new digital best practices are emerging. Therefore, once again, a big thank you to EU Luck Foundation for facilitating this exchange and I wish all of us a very insightful debate for the coming next hour and a half. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would sincerely like to thank all of our speakers for such an inspiring opening remarks here. Uh, there are some very insightful ideas that we can now focus on also in our discussion side. And what we like to say here in Estonia is that you can never waste crisis. So if something bad happens, then you need to use this moment in order to change things even better. And, and this is hopefully what we are able to do, and especially by sharing our experiences and the lessons learned. And hopefully today we have this wonderful opportunity to be able to share um, some of the lessons that we can uh, we can also teach to each other in a way. Uh, and hopefully um, the outcome from this uh, webinar is going to be something great for all of these regions that are linked to this um, this webinar today here. But before we're going to start with our very first uh, discussion here, um, I would like to do something uh, different uh, as is, uh, we need something to remember as well from this uh, webinar. Uh, we would like to do one family photo. So I would uh, kindly ask everyone now to turn on uh, the cameras uh, so that we could make this um, very quick uh, screenshots and, and so that we would have this wonderful uh, family photo all together of people that are participating in this um, panel discussion and, and webinar today here. So of course, also, if you put on the cameras, uh, then I would be happy to see all of your smiles as well. If you just take a couple of, couple of seconds as everyone are, are switching on the cameras again. The white smiles. <laughs> right. Do you think we're okay, Diego? All right. Yes, I think we should go. Thank you. All right, that's fantastic. Uh, we're now starting with the first panel, uh, which is going to be focusing on the similarities and differences between these two regions here. And I'm actually joined by two panelists who once again here have very impressive careers in the background. Um, so the first person that is going to join with me here is Louise Haxthausen, and she's the representative of UNESCO uh, to the EU, and she was appointed to the UNESCO office in Brussels in February 2019, so already a few years ago, and she joined the UNESCO already in 1993 and has been serving in many impressive positions such as Association Expert in Human Rights Division. She also has worked on conflicts and crisis response at country level in Afghanistan, in Palestine, uh, and more also recently as a director of UNESCO Office uh, for Iraq, 
Um, then also as a senior coordinator, uh, crisis and transition uh, response in the office of UNESCO Director General. Um, so thank you for joining me. And the second person that I have with me here in this panel is Natalia Armillos, and she's the Director uh, General for the Cultural Organization Ibero-American States. Uh, from 2009 to 2018, she was also the Director of Permanent Representative of the National Office of the OAE uh, in Ecuador uh, from October 2018 to December 2020. She served as a general director also as administration and accounting. And Natalia also has worked as a news reporter uh, for radio and television. But before we're going, uh, I'm going to give the floor to our speakers. So um, just some kind of opening also ideas here. So and, and numbers that I would also like to bring it out here. So what we know is that digital age is here to, of course, to stay here and has also drastically changed the way we live and interact, of course, also to each other. Especially now, turning the time of pandemic, which I always like to say was like a wake up call um, and, and real, um, that we all always like we realized in a way that we have to start changing the systems that we have had in place for, for years. And speaking about the digital technologies, it of course also helps us to spread the culture and really has had an impact on the cultural value chain, starting just from production side, distribution, access and being part of it. And obviously, there has been a number of challenges, especially by thinking of the years that we are facing and accessibility. Um, and the inclusion is one of the key words here and becomes more and more essential to our policymaker when they want to make different decisions in a way. And there are still, I would say, very, very big differences between uh, and within also the countries and regions in terms of digitalization. And um, they are still observable uh, between Latin America and when we compare this to the European Union. As I promised to bring it out some of the numbers as well here. So the internet penetration in the EU is uh, of uh, over 89% by the 2020 of the population and Latin America and Caribbean side only 73 which shows again that access to digital um, uh, tools in a way is not equal at all between these different regions. And this influences of course also collaboration and innovation aspects. And over the last decade, um, there has been remarkable progress, uh, especially in terms of mobile connectivity. And, and this has been achieved in many, many places. And when we advise from Estonian side, different policymakers, we always say that one of the first things that you need to be focusing on is to providing a proper access to internet to absolutely everyone, because I mean, it wouldn't. Um, I mean, it wouldn't make sense if you have solutions working, but if you don't have a proper internet connection. So this is definitely a topic that we should be addressing in, in all the aspects, also when it comes to uh, cultural policies here. Um, so now, um, the, our experts are going to focus on addressing um, the following questions. Um, so first of all, which are the main similarities and differences within and between both regions in terms of the degree of digitalization in the cultural industries and how is this the, uh, how is the COVID-19 pandemic also affecting here? So I would say, uh, let's start with uh, you, Luis. Um, you're working from Brussels, but you also have worked quite a lot with, uh, with other countries uh, based on your background. Uh, so maybe you can bring out some of the similarities and differences that you have seen in your job. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for, for the great introduction. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Bonilla, for, for, um, for, for inviting me to, to, to this webinar. It's really a pleasure to be with you. And um, uh, I would really like to thank you for inviting UNESCO for this discussion on what is a highly topical issue. Uh, I believe today, highly topical because, as was mentioned by previous speakers, because the COVID-19 crisis and the lockdown it has imposed on our societies across the world have accelerated in an exponential manner the use of digital technology for cultural production, as well as for access to culture. As COVID recovery policies and programs are being shaped at national, regional, and global levels, it is key to reflect, and it is really timely to reflect, as we're doing this, this afternoon, on lessons learned from the past year. This reflection should help us determining how digitalization supports culture, its diversity, 
its heritage, creativity, as well as their enjoyment as fundamental elements of recovery and longer term sustainable development. It's also highly topical to have the discussion for this particular forum, the EU LAC Foundation. Indeed, uh, as was mentioned by previous speakers, the EU leadership has put digital transformation at the heart of its transformative agenda within the Union and beyond. The European Digital Strategy and the more recent EU Digital Compass set an ambitious agenda to create a human-centered digital world around principles of human rights, sustainability and prosperity. UNESCO is actively engaged in monitoring the global impact of the COVID crisis on the culture sector and on cultural policies. On a monthly basis, we are issuing what we call the Tracker on Culture and Public Policy. It's a newsletter to monitor culture and public policy with regard to the UN Sustainable Development Agenda and, of course, in the more shorter term, uh, the whole COVID recovery. And one key dimension that we have been looking at is how digital technology has become a game changer for culture in the COVID context and beyond. I would like here to share with you some key findings in this regard, drawing on illustrations from Europe, from the LAC region, but also, if you allow me, from the rest of the world uh, in line with UNESCO's global mandate. And I think that would also just be uh, more fruitful for our discussions. Firstly, um, what we are witnessing is uh, cultural digitalization indeed as a tool of cultural democratization. Since the onset of the COVID crisis, people have looked to culture for solidarity, belonging, well being, and inspiration. Online consumption of cultural goods and services served across most regions and particularly in Europe through virtual exhibitions, concerts, music, streaming services. Uh, and this continued to be the case. The search and demand for online cultural services was matched with an overwhelming response from artists, cultural institutions, and communities. Artists have been offering free access to vast quantities of creative content. Cultural creators have developed new, innovative content. Online community initiatives have emerged around living heritage, its documentation, promotion, and safeguarding and how we can inspire us to live differently, more resiliently and sustainably during and after the COVID crisis. Where and when such content is interactive, popularity is high and has demonstrated new opportunities for cultural participation, blurring the lines, and I say blurring in a positive manner, between artists, cultural institutions, and their audiences, where everyone can take ownership of culture. In this sense, digital technology has proven to be indeed a powerful instrument of cultural democratization. It has been providing enhanced access to culture, developed new opportunities for participation in cultural life, and encouraged new forms of creativity. Finally, it has demonstrated the importance of recognizing culture not only as a public good, but also as an essential one that strengthens people's resilience in the face of adversity. However, nothing is without flaws and a number of important challenges to address to avoid cultural digitalization becomes in fact cultural deprivation. And this would be my second point. The increased sharing of cultural content online has amplified gaps in access and diversity, raising questions of inclusivity as digital content does not always target different audiences and may not be accessible to all. A worrisome eye-opener on online cultural diversity is that close to 80% of all websites are browsed in just 10 out of the 7,000 living languages in the world. The large disparity in digital access and infrastructure threatens to exclude many from benefiting from the digitalization of culture. For instance, in Sub-Saharan Africa, only 19% of the population has internet access, while a large part of this population live in rural areas where cable and satellite connectivity is sparse and costly. This reality 
is all low to a lesser extent compared to that of other regions of the world. The digital divide is of a geographical nature, but it is also a gender divide. Women's lower online access in comparison to men, compounded by women's dis disproportionate access to digital skills, jobs, and networks, risks the underrepresentation of women's creativity and voices online. One striking example here of the gender divide is that only 22% of all professionals working in the field of artificial intelligence are women. For the cultural and creative professions, the digitalization of their productions also raise important issues of remuneration and copyright. Digital streaming services and gaming are the few economic areas where activities have witnessed increased revenue during the pandemic. These trends, if not addressed, carry the risk of cultural digitalization, deepening inequalities in access to and participation in culture, and on a broader scale, limiting cultural diversity. Considering above, cultural democratization on one hand and cultural deprivation on the other, the accelerated use of digital technology prompted by the COVID crisis is shedding light on two important aspects of the state of culture in today's world. Firstly, power of culture, its essential role for personal and societal development. Secondly, the inequalities and fragility prevailing within the global culture ecosystem. In conclusion, let me suggest a few recommendations for digitalization to become a positive game changer, one that can contribute to fully unlock the potential of culture for sustainable and inclusive development. First recommendation, monitoring. In a rapidly evolving situation, as we were saying before, we need to keep track on what works and what does not when it comes to the use of digital technology in the field of culture. It's crucial to inform policy debate and making that will make the culture sector more resilient and cultural services more inclusive and sustainable. <clears throat> Sorry. Secondly, investment, both in terms of political will and funding in the development of cultural policies which address key gaps and challenges related to digitalization. UNESCO and the EU are promoting such, effort, such efforts in Latin America. We have supported Mexico in a Latin American exchange in best practices, programs and policies for strengthening indigenous and community media. And in Panama, we have, su we have supported CREA in Panama 2030, a national program, which provides a platform of exchange on the Create Economy for Sustainable Development, putting emphasis on the opportunities offered by digital transformation. And finally, investment in skills development. This is essential to address current divides and make digital transformation a force inclusion. In addition to basic skills that enable cultural participation of citizens large, advanced skills are needed for professionals to strengthen the creative and cultural industries. In the Caribbean, that is what we are doing through the UNESCO EU funded Couture program, which will launch an e-learning platform as a central element of the cultural training hub we are establishing in La Havana, Cuba. We look forward to scale up our partnership with the EU in Latin America and the Caribbean for the promotion of a digital transformation geared towards sustainable development and for culture at its heart. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luis. And, uh, and honestly, you, you mostly focus it, uh, focused on the aspects that I find the most important ones. Um, so um, bringing up the um, I would say the focus on the educational policies and raising awareness, which is also and has been one of the key elements in Estonia for years already, how to get everyone involved and, and how to especially give opportunities for uh, vulnerable groups such as women or, or children or, or, or like disabled people who can't access these things by themselves. So, so definitely this is something very, very essential. But now I would give the floor uh, to Natalia. Um, so you can also um, start with your remarks here. 
Muchísimas gracias, Anne. Eh, un placer eh, participar en este webinar. Muchísimas gracias a Fundación EULAC. Eh, muy buenos días y muy buenas tardes a todos quienes nos están eh, siguiendo. Pues efectivamente esta es una eh, estrategia, un evento muy importante para conocer qué está pasando en este momento de pandemia con un tema tan relevante como lo ha comentado eh, hace pocos minutos Luis, eh, la importancia de las políticas culturales del sector cultural en este proceso de resiliencia en, en plena pandemia. Voy a compartir mi pantalla para presentar eh, brevemente eh, una diapositiva que he preparado sobre, eh, a ver, que he preparado para que me acompañe en esta eh, presentación. Un momento, por favor. Bien, para mi intervención me apoyaré en información y datos relevados en el último año por parte de instituciones como eh, la CEPAL, ¿sí? como la CEPAL, el BID, la UNESCO o el CAF y corporaciones multinacionales que han identificado el actual momento como una oportunidad para su expansión. Me refiero sobre todo a plataformas digitales que también se han interesado por estudiar, evaluar, analizar y reflexionar sobre el momento que toda la población está viviendo con el uso de la tecnología para acercarnos, ya que justamente la pandemia nos ha impuesto cuarentenas, aislamiento social, la tecnología nos ha brindado esta oportunidad de no perder las relaciones. Entre los estudios que también se han reportado en este último año, eh, voy a mencionar una evaluación del impacto del COVID en las industrias culturales y creativas, una iniciativa conjunta del MERCOSUR, la UNESCO, el BID, la CEGIP y la OI, que llevamos a cabo el año pasado, justamente en el último semestre, y que ya en diciembre eh, adelantamos unos primeros datos y en pocas semanas estaremos presentando ya la publicación final de este importante estudio, que por un lado es verdad que analiza los datos, las políticas que se han practicado en 11 países, los relacionados con el MERCOSUR, pero que de alguna manera nos dan ya eh, datos importantes que se pueden extrapolar a la región de América Latina y el Caribe. ¿Cuál es esta situación tecnológica de, y de la conectividad en la región? Recientemente, Luis Felipe López Calva, subsecretario general adjunto de la ONU y director regional de América Latina y el Caribe, publicó el artículo Estás en mute. ¿Por qué el acceso a Internet no es suficiente para la digitalización inclusiva de América Latina y el Caribe? En el cual desarrolla importantes indicadores a tener en cuenta. A pesar de los importantes avances en la cobertura de banda ancha en la región y el gran porcentaje de personas que poseen teléfono móvil, la mayoría de la población se encuentra lejos de tener las herramientas, conocimientos y oportunidades para hacer uso de la digitalización como motor para mejorar sus condiciones de vida. Es así como la digitalización en la región toma forma de una pirámide invertida que en cada escalón va dejando atrás a millones de personas de América Latina y el Caribe. La desigualdad digital persiste en América Latina y el Caribe, tanto al interior como entre países. En la región, el acceso a tecnologías básicas ha ganado terreno. Prácticamente la totalidad de las zonas urbanas en América Latina y el Caribe tienen cobertura de banda ancha móvil y poco más de un 84% de la población tiene un teléfono móvil. Sin embargo, los contratos de teléfonos celulares cayeron por primera vez en la historia. De 103 por 100 habitantes en 2019 a 99 por 100 habitantes en el 2020, según un informe de ITU del 2020. Es por ello que, a pesar de que el 84 por ciento tiene un teléfono móvil, Tan solo el 69% de las personas reporta hacer uso de Internet. A partir de este punto, el acceso a tecnologías digitales comienza a ser profundamente desigual. Siguiendo con la posibilidad de realizar tareas remotas, 
El principal determinante es que los hogares cuenten con acceso a un servicio de banda ancha fija. Aquí la heterogeneidad se vuelve cada vez más relevante. En países como Chile y Costa Rica, se reporta que más del 85% de los hogares tiene internet. Pero en países como Bolivia y Guatemala, este porcentaje no llega al 25%. Una vez con acceso a internet en el hogar, la posibilidad de realizar trabajo o estudios de manera remota requiere en su gran mayoría de una computadora. Ahí el porcentaje de hogares que cuenta con una es todavía menor. La desigualdad entre países va del 65 y 68% en Argentina y Uruguay al 17% en países como Honduras, El Salvador y el 11% en Haití. Al interior de los países, las desigualdades están muy marcadas por la dimensión urbano-rural. Por ejemplo, la adopción de Internet muestra niveles muy superiores en áreas ur urbanas, como lo muestra el caso de Brasil, donde el año 2017 el nivel de adopción era de 65% en áreas urbanas y de solo el 33.6% en, en áreas rurales. O en el caso de Ecuador, que en el 2017 el nivel de adopción era del 46% y en áreas urbanas de solo el 16.6% en áreas rurales, según un informe de CAF del 2020. Otro factor relevante es el uso que se le da al Internet, el cual determina si la persona está siendo capaz de realizar tareas de forma virtual que antes requerían el contacto físico, o si en su mayoría solo se utiliza para comunicación básica en redes sociales. Según el Índice de Resiliencia Digital del Hogar, creado con este objeto por el CAF, esta virtualización aún es limitada. El índice combina cuatro indicadores, descarga de apps para la salud, descargas de apps educativas, densidad de plataformas FinTech, y la intensidad de comercio electrónico. El índice en estos indicadores deben servir como un proxy de los países cuya población está más preparada para afrontar la cuarentena sanitaria mediante la digitalización de sus hogares. En el índice se puede ver la marcada heterogeneidad dentro de la región. El CAF interpreta que de manera agregada la posibilidad de los hogares para acceder a información sanitaria, realizar transacciones monetarias, adquirir bienes y comercio electrónico y contribuir a la educación de niños en países con un índice inferior a 30 es limitada. Se instala de forma generalizada la percepción de que la pandemia aceleró y profundizó dificultades históricas y preexistentes, como la informalidad y vulnerabilidad laboral, dificultades para proteger los derechos de autor, la creciente brecha digital, la concentración económica y geográfica, y a la vez que generó nuevos modos de inequidad y desigualdad, acelerada reconversión de actividades, falta de incentivos, capacitación y herramientas que acompañen la transformación del mercado laboral que trasladan al ámbito digital las desigualdades del mundo de la presencialidad. Entre los, las metodologías que aplicamos para el estudio del impacto del COVID-19 en las industrias creativas y culturales de Mercosur, una iniciativa conjunta de Mercosur, la UNESCO, BID, OEI y CEGIP, consistimos en llevar a cabo entrevistas a los protagonistas del sector cultural, tanto a los empresarios como a los trabajadores y a los propios artistas, creadores y gestores culturales. Una de las respuestas más repetidas tiene que ver con que la llegada de la pandemia instala a la digitalización como ganadora en el debate entre la oferta digital y presencialidad. Y se instala con fuerza y rapidez un proceso de digitalización que se venía desarrollando tímidamente. En la mayoría de los países se observa que la principal respuesta de artistas y personas que trabajan en las industrias creativas y culturales ha sido migrar rápida y masivamente, siempre que la infraestructura y el acceso a equipamiento lo han permitido, 
al territorio digital, ya sea para el dictado de clases, la exhibición de obras y o la difusión de contenidos. Entre las actividades que se han implementado en formato digital se incluye la creación y difusión de podcasts, una herramienta que permite llegar a audiencias sin buena conexión a internet. En comunidades rurales se puede acceder a este formato a través de WhatsApp y la realización de obras de teatro a través de plataforma Zoom, por ejemplo, incorporando la estética de la misma como recurso narrativo. La virtualidad obligó también a una reingeniería en el desarrollo de, en el desarrollo de audiencias, ya que una vez suspendida la presencialidad, la migración a la virtualidad supuso la necesidad de dar impulso a la comunicación por redes sociales y a la creación de nuevos públicos. Surgen nuevos actores en las cadenas de valor y otros quedan desplazados. Esto requiere el desarrollo de nuevas competencias. De la mano de la digitalización se aceleró también el comercio electrónico. También ha dado un salto excepcional. Empresas comunitarias y cámaras ya consolidadas han desarrollado plataformas de comercio electrónico local para comercializar productos de todo tipo. Se suman a estos esfuerzos los streaming o transmisiones en vivo de eventos y la realización de capacitaciones sobre diversas temáticas. También se han creado y difundido plataformas digitales de exhibición de contenidos audiovisuales nacionales que han permitido un crecimiento exponencial de las audiencias y consumos culturales. Pero en general, las personas están más acostumbradas a pagar por acceso a contenidos extranjeros y de las gran, grandes plataformas que por el contenido de origen nacional, salvo en casos de conciertos masivos y de cine. La música en vivo y el teatro fueron dos de las actividades que más rápidamente se volcaron al mundo digital, exhibiendo obras y realizando streamings a través de distintas plataformas y redes sociales. A pesar de esto, en ambos sectores se manifestó que la gran mayoría de los contenidos difundidos de manera digital no generaron réditos económicos significativos. La gran mayoría de los artistas y creadores llevaron adelante actividades virtuales, más como una forma de mantener una conexión con el público, de aportar cultura en tiempos de tristeza y aislamiento social, que de generar beneficios económicos. La cancelación de actividades presenciales y con público y las restricciones a la circulación han impactado en los modos de exhibición tradicional y en los sistemas tradicionales de generación de ingresos. Es por eso por lo que las artes escénicas, la música en vivo y las actuaciones presenciales son las más afectadas. Y por el contrario, las actividades vinculadas a videojuegos y cultura digital son las que más han crecido. Las políticas públicas implementadas a nivel regional con relación a las industrias creativas y culturales durante la pandemia dejan en evidencia, según las personas entrevistadas en esta evaluación, la apreciación social sobre el sector cultural. Por un lado, la cultura se instala con fuerza en la política pública, ocupando un lugar central y una valoración que hasta el momento no tenía. La sociedad jerarquizó la cultura como un aspecto central. En algunos casos, se la asocia incluso a un tema de salud pública y bienestar mental. Pero a la vez, la inversión en cultura es discutida y resistida por algunos sectores, incluso por administraciones públicas, sobre la base de que la cultura y el apoyo a las actividades vinculadas a las industrias creativas y culturales son un destino que en este momento no debe ser priorizado. En muchos casos se impone la idea de que la salud es más importante y se cuestiona el apoyo directo a artistas, trabajadores, empresas y organizaciones de las industrias creativas y culturales, por la premisa de que están quitando recursos clave que deberían destinarse a áreas de atención directa a la emergencia sanitaria. Esta percepción tiene consecuencias concretas, como los recortes presupuestarios 
el desfinanciamiento de las infraestructuras y equipamientos culturales públicos, así como la falta de cobertura en términos de seguridad social para quienes se dedican a esta actividad. Esta, por ejemplo, es una tabla que se muestra cómo ha sido la variación del presupuesto del 2020, incluyendo ya el presupuesto extra que se esperaba para atender la pandemia desde el sector cultura. Las capacitaciones en recursos digitales han proliferado ante la obligación de los sectores culturales de volcarse hacia estas nuevas herramientas. Esto ha propiciado nuevas instancias de colaboración entre las distintas disciplinas, como en el caso de la transmisión en directo de obras teatrales y eventos musicales. La inclusión de recursos digitales en obras y eventos habilitados para la presencialidad, manejo de redes sociales, inclusión de la realidad aumentada e in interactividad digital en museos, entre otros, lo cual ha enriquecido la calidad y versatilidad de los productos ofrecidos. La contracara de esta situación, en principio favorable, es que bajo la adopción de nuevos saberes digitales, se fomenta una situación de multitarea extrema, en la que los empleadores comiencen a exigir a los trabajadores una serie de competencias que no necesariamente tengan que ver con su formación o experiencia. La cooperación público-privada también fue mencionada durante las entrevistas realizadas. Según expresan las personas entrevistadas, aunque la asignación de más recursos es una necesidad urgente y fundamental, también lo son la necesidad de planificar nuevas sinergias entre el Estado, la comunidad artística, trabajadores y el sector empresarial, para generar empleos más estables, mayores ganancias y nuevas actividades. Sin duda, las primeras reacciones han estado orientadas a paliar la emergencia, por lo que aún no son tan visibles los cambios de la orientación de las políticas públicas para el sector cultural. De todos modos, ha sido destacado que, a pesar de las dificultades, este es un momento propicio para innovar en cultura e impulsar transformaciones profundas y duraderas, sobre todo porque la brecha social y económica puede profundizarse de forma significativa si no se toman medidas de protección e inclusión para quienes se dedican a las industrias creativas y culturales y en general del sector cultural. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Natalia, and, and, and seriously, like the overview and the work that you have been doing is very, very impressive. And, and thanks for, for spending your time on, on, on making the work kind of place in a way. Um, I would kindly like to remind all of our participants also that you have a chance to address your own questions to our experts. You can do that in a Q&A section and then at the very end of this uh, webinar, we're going to ask these questions from our experts. And, and if, these, uh, if we don't have enough time to address all the questions, then um, it will be also conducted to the report later that will be sent to you, all of our participants here. But I will be happy now to move over to the second section here, which is going to focus a little bit more on the opportunities and challenges, which was also which were also addressed by the previous speakers. But right now we would try to stick on, on these aspects that we're going to talk about what are the main opportunities and challenges because I think here that we definitely need to have a deepened awareness of these opportunities and challenges that digitalization and you know, can, can actually bring also to the cultural sector. And internet obviously has changed the way not only the cultural services and products are delivered, but of course also how they are produced in a way. And there are several difficulties for small and, and low income industries and uh, to remove their uh, products and, and deliver their work, um, despite also uh, the emergence of, uh, of the new uh, platforms that they would have to start using. Uh, but on a positive note, um, people have access to culture and, and brings more, much more also new opportunities to interconnect public uh, communication policies also with a culture. So now we have an excellent opportunity to also hear some of the thoughts on that uh, specific topic from our experts. And, um, and the following experts are, first of all, uh, Monica Urien, and who is currently policy officer at the European Commission. 
uh, Directorate General Education and Culture, and also responsible for international cultural relations, culture and well-being, and, and freedom of uh, artistic expressions. And she was previously also the program manager in the same EU institution responsible for the audience development uh, and pro, uh, priority within the uh, creative Europe uh, program culture. Um, secondly, we, I also have together with me here Octavia Kules, I hope I pronounced her last name correctly, uh, who is the director uh, in DESEO and UNESCO expert as well. And he has been um, one first academic digital publisher in Latin America since 2012. He has uh, served as a coordinator of the digital uh, lab of the uh, international alliances and independent uh, publisher also based in Paris. So our next uh, experts now will address the following questions such as what are the main challenges and opportunities on a regional level and when it also comes to reducing the cap in terms of digitalization and, and, and of course also which are the main advantages and disadvantages of the entities and actors in charge of cultural policy makings. So um, I would give the, uh, the first word to you, uh, Monica. Maybe you can address your, your thoughts here. And I would kindly ask to stick on, on the time limit that we had um, because we are a little bit already over the time. Hello, everyone. Um, hola a todos, buen dia. I'm very happy to, um, uh, to participate in this webinar and to see so many familiar faces uh, and uh, new ones, of course. I think occasions like this are more precious uh, now that we are socially distanced, which is a bit mis misnomer since we are socially connected, so it's more like physical distancing. Um, I will mainly address the topic today through the EU angle, which will give us the chance to think about how to better learn with each other and to better face challenges and foster cooperations, um, especially the ones that are common within the EU and the uh, Latin American Caribbean. As, as you have already heard a bit before, um, support to culture and creation in the digital context uh, is a key priority in the policies of the European Union. Way before the pandemic crisis, in fact, uh, cultural and creative sectors were experimenting new models to respond to the digital reshaping of the way culture is produced, distributed and enjoyed by the public. The crisis has accelerated this process and this is what we are looking at today. Digital technologies offer certainly great opportunities for culture, for example, in terms of artists and their work reaching new audiences and publics. This is a topic on which I worked a lot in the context of Creative Europe in my previous uh, assignment on audience development, or by making our cultural heritage more accessible and preserving it for future generations. At the same time, there are a lot of challenges, of course. Uh, for example, digitization has meant adaptation processes for cultural industries. For example, the music industry's radical restructuring to return to profitability in recent years. Also for cultural heritage institutions and professionals, uh, for example, the new skills and infrastructure needs and new forms of digital consumption of cultural production have brought changes in the value chains with the emergence and consolidations of dominant internet-based players. Our policies in the EU seek to maximize the opportunities and address the challenges by providing an ecosystem where artists, cultural and creative professionals and European productions can thrive. This policy approach has become more, even more important with the current pandemic crisis, which has hit hard our cultural and creative sector. As a matter of fact, during the lockdown, like you said, uh, many of you, we have all enjoyed all sorts of cultural content online, very often for free, uh, which poses the question of artist remuneration, of course. At the same time, the digital channel has been instrumental for many players in maintaining the connection with their world, with their audiences, and maybe have created new opportunities uh, for like new audiences for the future. This also reinforced the contribution of the cultural sector to health, particularly mental health and well-being, something on which we are working uh, right now and I'm particularly involved in it, personally involved in it. Uh, strengthening digital skills is another topic that has emerged as an even more compelling issue in this context. To address all these opportunities and challenges, in the EU, we rely on various levers. One lever is the funding of projects through our dedicated program for the cultural and creative sectors, Creative Europe, uh, but also through other programs like Horizon Europe for research and Digital Europe, of course. We have just started a new cycle in our support programs. 
And for example, Creative Europe, we have a very strong focus on the digital dimension. Uh, the ambition is to facilitate the learning curve among cultural and creative operators on how best to benefit from the advantages of a digital environment. In this respect, we also seek to develop a more strategic approach for some sectors that are at the forefront of digitization. For example, for music, we have a Music Moves Europe, a specific initiative dedicated to this sector that aims to promote the diversity and competitiveness of the sector hand in hand. In this context, for example, discoverability and diversity of European music and its cross-border circulation are important topics linked to, digit linked to digitization. Another lever is policy cooperation. Here, of course, the EU is a supranational organization that has, doesn't have a full-fledged power when it comes to cultural policy, since we are you know, working in context of sub subsidiarity. But it has a supportive and complementary role to the policies and actions of our member states. It is in this context that we seek to promote, for example, cooperation through what we call the open method of coordination, which brings together government experts working on a voluntary basis to discuss common topical issues for culture and share experiences and practices that can be useful across the union and hopefully beyond. Um, in these last few years, the challenges raised by digitization have been high on the agenda. For example, an expert group on promoting access to culture via digital means, and also another one on promoting reading in the digital environment. A further essential lever is a, a regulatory intervention. Through this lever, we are shaping a sustainable and forward-looking regulatory environment, which enables and supports our European cultural diversity, creativity, and access to culture. In this context, we must take into account that digitization and economic challenges for culture are closely interrelated. This is why some crucial legislative reforms for culture and the creative sectors in the EU have taken place in the framework of our core project to build the European single market, also for the digital world, our digital single market. Here we have notably achieved the modernization of European copyright rules and the major update of the European audiovisual regulatory framework. These two reforms have addressed the most pressing issues arising in the digital transition, such as the level playing field with online platforms and the remuneration of creators. In particular, new rules streamline now the copyright liability of digital services like YouTube, Dailymotion, or Facebook, to name just the biggest ones, whose business model is based on providing access to creative works. This should empower creative sectors and creators to decide on and negotiate better remuneration deals for the use of their works on digital platforms. At the same time, new rules empower individual creators and artists to have fairer remuneration through more transparent and balanced relations with the contractual partners through whom they seek to exploit economically their creations and performances. For audiovisual media services, the updated legislation further supports the promotion and visibility of European culture in its diversity in a digital context. On the one hand, video on demand services have to ensure a minimum quota of 30% for European productions in their catalogs and ensure that these are visible to consumers. On the other hand, EU member states whose audience is targeted by online VOD providers can impose on a cross-border basis obligations to invest or financially contribute to the production of European works. Our priority is now to ensure that all these reforms are effective and that their benefits are felt on the ground through a timely and efficient implementation. Besides, new proposals for the further regulation of online platforms have been tabled recently. They will complement the said reforms to ensure a fair online environment for the creative sectors and promote, promote a level playing field that is crucial to strengthen European content and support essential values such as cultural diversity and media pluralism in the digital context. Important EU values and also EU um, lack uh, values, common values. More broadly, the majority of internet traffic is around video and creative content, so that the cultural and creative industries are key to generating user profiles and economic value of online players. To better accompany in this context the digital transformation, we have also a new action plan called Europe's Media in the Digital Decade. It includes several measures to support the recovery and transformation and innovation. For example, in the context of the funds allocated to the European recovery post-COVID, each national plan will earmark a minimum level of 20% of expenditure for digital. Other measures seek to harness data and exploit the potential of the emerging immersive technologies and to empower Europeans by increasing access to content and strengthening media literacy. 
another important topic linked, linked to skills that you also mentioned, the previous speaker mentioned. Without a strong policy response to overcome the creative industry's fragmentation in the face of the global platform's massive investments in content, there is a risk of relegating European independent players, as well as Latin American and Caribbean ones, to mere service providers. Harnessing the benefits of digitization will be key for future competitiveness through their great spillover effects in terms of innovation across the economy, and also to promote the image of our respective regions across the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much to you, uh, Monica, as well. And um, now I would like to address the question, um, how to make sure that vulnerable groups and minorities are represented uh, in the digit digitized uh, culture sphere and, and, and culture is, is always like diverse and inclusive in times of digitalization. Um, to our second um, uh, person here in this section, uh, who is Octavia. So Octavia, um, could you take it over from here i hope octavia are you hi, yeah hi anand thank you very much i'll switch to to spanish eh, bueno muchísimas gracias por la por la invitación es un, un placer estar aquí eh, los saludo desde buenos aires en este momento y bueno como como todos sabemos y como hemos visto a lo largo del seminario estamos atravesando un periodo sumamente complejo no hay ningún sector de la cultura que haya salido indemne de la crisis de COVID-19. Un informe publicado por la UNESCO en el año 2020 indicó que 90% de los museos debieron cancelar sus actividades durante los primeros meses de la pandemia y que 10% del total de los museos probablemente deberá cerrar sus puertas de manera definitiva. El impacto de la pandemia ha sido durísimo también para los teatros, los cines las librerías, las salas de conciertos, entre tantos otros espacios que son vitales para las expresiones culturales. Ahora bien, si la pandemia ha constituido un golpe muy fuerte para los sectores analógicos, desde el año pasado, como hemos visto en el seminario, el consumo de contenidos digitales ha crecido de una manera vertiginosa. Por ejemplo, a través de las plataformas de video bajo demanda. Muchos de estos cambios seguramente serán irreversibles. Y en cierta forma, yo creo que este quiebre tan, tan dramático que vemos hoy ha, ha dejado en evidencia las grandes deficiencias del pasado, sobre todo respecto eh, de la falta de una estrategia de cultura digital en muchas regiones del mundo. En el año 2017 tuve la, la ocasión de estudiar la cuestión de, de, de la cultura digital en, en los países hispanohablantes, en un informe que escribí para la, la UNESCO, titulado La cultura en el entorno digital. Y ahí, eh, bueno, visité cinco países, Argentina, Colombia, Ecuador, España y México. Hice un buen número de entrevistas a, a diferentes actores del mundo de la cultura, del sector público, del, del sector de las ONGs también. Y un poco la idea era ver cómo las tecnologías influían en, en el ámbito de, las, de los artistas, de las industrias culturales y de las audiencias para tratar de identificar cuáles eran los principales desafíos y las oportunidades que enfrentaban en este nuevo entorno. Y a pesar de todos los problemas, lo que era muy claro es que había fenómenos muy interesantes e innovadores, tanto desde el sector privado, privado como del sector público, pero generalmente se trataba de eh, como iniciativas aisladas, sin que existiera una visión nacional o, o más aún regional latino latinoamericana de cultura digital. Y cuando irrumpe la crisis del COVID, la fractura ocurre precisamente allí, porque la, la mayor parte de los actores del ecosistema cultural carecían de una estrategia digital de largo plazo. Y por una estrategia de, digital me refiero no solamente a la idea de producir contenidos digitales, sino a algo, a algo mucho más amplio que tiene que ver con la la comercialización y la comunicación a través de redes sociales y otros canales. Cuando se anuló el contacto físico debido a las cuarentenas, los únicos, los únicos actores que pudieron seguir operando fueron quienes ya tenían consolidada su presencia virtual de antes. Y esto no es algo que se pueda lograr en algunas semanas. Por eso es que fue 
tan, eh, un, un shock tan brutal para tantos actores más analógicos. Y creo entonces que en este momento es preciso trabajar en, en dos direcciones. Una más de corto plazo, que consistiría en eh, acompañar, a, a que los, acompañar, ayudar a los actores más tradicionales que están más afectados, sobre todo para garantizar que no desaparezcan entramados culturales enteros. Y a largo plazo me parece que tenemos que trabajar en, en toda la región en desarrollar una estrategia de cultura digital que sea integral y que sea duradera. Estamos ante una ocasión única para pensar a fondo los desafíos y las oportunidades que las tecnologías digitales presentan para las artes y la cultura. Y a partir de todo ese análisis de, las, eh, de los desafíos y las oportunidades, podremos diseñar una visión de cultura digital que no solo se aplique a 2021 por la pandemia, sino también, también a 2025 o a 2030. Entonces, para mencionar brevemente cuáles considero que son los principales desafíos y oportunidades, y acá coincido en todo lo que comentó Mónica, para no repetirme voy a eh, saltear varias de las cosas que ella ya mencionó. Eh, con respecto primero a los desafíos, insistir, bueno, siempre los desafíos, creo que en, en el mundo de lo digital son dobles, son obstáculos y amenazas. Los obstáculos son las barreras que nos impiden disfrutar de lo digital. Y en, el, en ese eh, campo de los obstáculos, hay que recordar, como también se mencionó antes, que una buena parte de la población de Latinoamérica, casi un 30%, no tiene acceso a Internet. Esta brecha frena cualquier tipo de actividad, no solo el consumo, sino también la creación y el despliegue de industrias culturales en el entorno digital. Hay también enormes disparidades de conectividad entre las capitales y el resto del territorio. Por ejemplo, en Buenos Aires, la conexión de banda ancha puede llegar a ser siete veces más rápida que en algunas provincias. Y faltan también habilidades. Es urgente que los diferentes actores culturales accedan a una formación más amplia en términos de saberes digitales. Me refiero a, a todo tipo de actor cultural, público o privado, y en cualquier lugar de la cadena de valor, ya sea la, la creación, la producción, la distribución, el acceso y la participación. Ahora, con respecto a las amenazas, que son también desafíos, pero no son tanto barreras, sino que son nuevos riesgos que surgen, nuevos peligros. Incluso si la pandemia terminara pronto, supongamos el mes que viene, muchos artistas y emprendedores culturales enfrentarán dificultades para reinventarse. Y, y es porque estamos asistiendo, como, como todos sabemos, a una cuarta, llamada Cuarta Revolución Industrial, que se caracteriza, entre otras tendencias, por la automatización de, de, de toda nuestra vida. Entonces ahí entra la inteligencia artificial, la robotización, la Internet de las cosas, etc. Y en concreto la, la inteligencia artificial puede llegar a, es, un, es una herramienta que tiene un enorme potencial creativo. En los últimos años tuve la, la, la suerte de participar en, en muchas investigaciones sobre el impacto de la, de la inteligencia artificial en, ecos, en el ecosistema cultural y todo parece indicar que estamos ante las puertas de una, eh, una suerte de explosión creativa sin precedentes en la historia humana. El problema es que los beneficios de esa explosión tal vez no se distribuyan o seguramente no se van a distribuir de manera equitativa a escala global y a escala de cada país. Esto puede desembocar en la destrucción masiva de empleos en el sector, sector cultural y de una manera muy acelerada. Además puede hacer que las, las grandes plataformas ocupen porciones aún mayores del mercado y esto puede resultar en una concentración económica irreversible. Pero aún así existen enormes oportunidades. Si logramos resolver las brechas y empoderar a los creadores y a las industrias culturales locales, podríamos propiciar la conformación de un ecosistema cultural muchísimo más amplio, más dinámico y próspero. Sobre todo creo que hay que tener en cuenta que nuestra región, América Latina, tenía tradicionalmente enormes dificultades para constituirse en un mercado cultu cultural uniforme debido a las grandes distancias geográficas, a las diferencias regulatorias que, que, que había entre cada país y a 
esta falta de infraestructura cultural básica, ¿no? que hay sobre todo en, en, en el interior de, de nuestros países, librerías, bibliotecas, teatros, etc. Un buen uso, una buena aplicación de las tecnologías digitales podría contribuir a democratizar el acceso y la creatividad. Y sobre todo a aprovechar la fuerza de un mercado formidable, que es un mercado conformado por más de 600 millones de personas que están ávidas por compartir sus creaciones y su cultura. Pero insisto, cerrar las brechas es un paso clave, pero hay que ir más allá. Hay que fomentar también la creatividad y la viabilidad del mercado cultural en el entorno digital. Si solo trabajamos en, 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 en cerrar las brechas, tendremos una región de consumidores. Pero necesitamos también, hoy más que nunca, una región de creadores, una región de productores, una región de distribuidores de cultura en la era digital. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much uh, to you, Octavia, for your interesting thoughts here. Personally, I have been marked on so many new ideas that I, I, I have heard from our experts today. So I also hope that our participants uh, feel the same. Uh, and, and once again, you can still ask the questions as, as we, our experts are pretty active also answering uh, uh, the questions. So you have this amazing chance to be talking to the experts and getting your own answers there. So um, I, I would kindly ask you to, to submit your questions there. But let's continue now with our uh, last section here, which will be focusing more on bringing out the best practices that we have been seeing both in Latin American countries and also on the EU side here. So uh, my, my question to our experts before I'm, I'm going to tell who is going to be here in this panel um, is that which are the good practices in countries in the EU and Latin America um, and, and Caribbean side of a clear and precise regulation frameworks to remote diversity in digital media and, and of course also which existing mechanism and platforms could be explored um, so as to share the expertise and shed light uh, up in successful initiatives in the field of digitalization in both uh, between these both uh, regions in a way. Uh, but before um, I, we're going to hear the experts, so also uh, we have four people uh, here in this section. Um, first of all, uh, Gita Schock, uh, and she is the director of EU National Institutes for Culture since 2018. She has been uh, also the director of the EU National Institute for Culture and the European Network organizations involved in the cultural relations. And previously also she was the founding director of, of the uh, Kota Institute branch in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and, and then also has held different functions for the Goethe Institute, uh, which is the Germans, uh, Germany's uh, largest cultural relations organization. Um, secondly, we also have uh, Tony Attard, uh, who is a board member network of, uh, for uh, culture policy designers and founder and director at the Culture Venture. And he is also the founder of the director um, of the Culture Venture, in, an international advisory firm uh, specialized in the culture and creative uh, sectors. And he was also the first director of the strategy at our council in Malta. Uh, and as I understood that, he is also joining us today. Uh, from uh, all the way from uh, Malta. And he's currently the vice president of Malta Entertainment Industry and Arts Association as well. Um, then as a third person here, we also had Natalie uh, Urquhart um, and, and she's the executive committee member of Museum Association of the Caribbean side um, and um, of the National Gallery of the Cayman Islands, and she is also the leading authority of Caymanian uh, art and has published uh, regular papers on the subject and, and well as uh, the book of art of Cayman Islands and, and the island's first formal art history um, as well here. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have Clementine uh, Duboeuf, uh, who is the associate director uh, of the European Affairs, and she is uh, Associate Director of the European Affairs, where she is responsible especially for the PIA communications and has been managing communications and um, dissemination activities of the EU-founded projects uh, from elaborating strategies uh, to actual implementation and also the coordination side. 
She also has experiences more than six years in the European research and culture, uh, creative industries, as well as managing international online communities and, and different uh, projects. So once again, I guess we have plenty of, of interesting people here. And I will first of all give the floor to Gita um, so that you can share your best practices that you have learned and you would like to share with our audience today here. Thank you very much. Thank you also to the EU LAC Foundation for the uh, repeated invitation to join one of your events. And I think it's a very uh, encouraging sign that uh, the EU LAC Foundation has also been focusing its efforts on strengthening the cultural exchange between Europe and the LAC uh, region. So that's great. I hope we can see um, also in the future some activities or some policy uh, dialogue that comes out of it, uh, so that we also see, um, yeah, uh, engagement happening on the ground together with artists and cultural professionals. Um, so my background is, yeah, uh, on cultural relations. Uh, the unique EU National um, Institutes for Culture is a network um, of the um, cultural institutes of the EU member states and associate countries. And, uh, and we're active um, all over the world, um, including in, the, uh, uh, in Latin America and, uh, and the Caribbean. Um, and what is our, yeah, our network? It's basically a network of co-creation. So we are trying to bring the European dimension to cultural relations, which is a traditionally a domain of the EU member states. And so each country has their own organization. And when we are active, it's about working together with organizations, with cultural professionals, with um, artists from our partner countries all over the world. And so um, I've brought three examples today. I know that uh, time is tight, so I'll be brief. Um, I was wondering actually with the team of EOLAC if I could share some links and what would be the best way to do that. Maybe you can let me know. Um, I'm not gonna share any videos just to uh, prevent any mishaps. Um, so in terms of digitalization, um, when we bring uh, cultural professionals from uh, Europe and the wider world together, of course, what we're mainly about is um, people to people exchanges. Our motto is to create trust and understanding between the peoples of Europe and the wider world. And so it's about making learning experiences or any other experiences between people. And so now that we have the pandemic for the first time, um, activities had to be shifted to the online realm. Of course, digitization was already a topic before, and there were um, platforms created or projects that had a digital component. But I think we have never experienced in the sort of 60 to 100 years of this field um, of uh, having existed, we've never experienced a moment where mobility was down as much as it is now. So what does it mean for our work? In order to find out, we did conduct um, a survey among our members um, at the beginning of the pandemic. So now we have to do a follow-up survey to actually learn uh, from the learnings from our members. And what we um, what we found out at the at that point um, last year, one year ago, was that um, of course organizations themselves were boosted in their digital development. So that you know things like signatures that this could happen online but also that this changed the thinking about the nature of our work. And if our mobility, the way we have, um, we've known it, if that is still something that can and should continue taking into the account also the sustainable development agenda, sustain, sustainable development goals, climate change, environmental impact, but also fairness in, broader, um, in the broader um, scope of the world. And so what we see now is a shifting of formats maybe to do less touring exhibitions for instance into more into formats that are long term or longer term meaning uh, residencies that bring people to, together artists that actually stay for an extended period of time in um, in a host country to work with artists on the ground um, and of course we have seen any of these formats that we used to do before that we've seen them also being transferred in the, into the digital, meaning that artists collaborate um, through the internet, through Zoom or through Skype, and actually work on artworks together, which are then uh, implemented or delivered 
uh, only by those present in a certain uh, country. We've seen that in Mongolia, for instance. So that does work as well. I think right now what we're exper exper experiencing is a time of experiment, meaning that um, it's to see which formats can be done digitally, where is it actually beneficial to work with the internet and where is it not, where do we need to come back to actual physical um, um, yeah, connections and where does it make sense to do hybrid formats. I could imagine, for example, that conferences like these um, work really well um, and I think we can engage with each other and we can learn from each other. So learning experiences can happen, can happen online. But however, I already know some of you only from the internet, sort of you are in the internet for you, I am in the internet, but some of you I've also met in person. And of course, these, um, these um, meetings, they stick, they create a memory, uh, which is much harder to do uh, online. But in any case, to, um, to jump into some of the um, um, co-creational projects, co-creation is at the core of our work. And I would say it's actually, we really mean co-creation. We mean coming together and together design projects and implement them um, with, with cultural professionals from both sides of the ocean. And uh, one of our main uh, initiatives currently is European Spaces of Culture. European Spaces of Culture is testing new ways of European collaboration with partners on the ground. So rather than for you sort of to build their own EU National Institute for Culture, we as the member states and organizations, we're getting together with local partners, trying to create a true space of co-creation. And one project that is currently um, piloting this initiative and finding a new model for this is happening in uh, Central America, um, in three countries, um, Honduras, Salvador, and Guatemala. And they have created a or they, what they wanted to do was actually um, capacity building in the theater sector, connecting these uh, professional scenes of these three countries. And of course, this was not possible due to uh, the pandemic. And so they are testing currently what does work online. So they've done capacity workshops um, online. They have done workshops on internationalization of those cultural scenes online. And they are also planning a platform uh, which will go live um, later this month. So all of this is happening at the moment as we speak. Uh, they, they will create a platform um, of virtual presentation of the theater performances, co-created theater performances um, the, of Triangolo Teatro. And there is also a link I can share about some of the workshops that have taken place um, in, one, in these three countries and the sort of co-creation with European um, artists and dramaturgists have been done online. And the, I think what we want to hear from projects like these as they're fin they finalizing their work is, has it worked? Um, and to what extent has it worked? What, mm. are, the, what are the results? Um, so we've heard from Cuba also earlier today uh, from UNESCO, there's a great project uh, for young people going on in Cuba. And um, our members um, are working on a project called Click Culture to Connect in Cuba. And uh, it's supposed to um, bridge Europe and Cuba and boost the Cuban cultural and creative industries and artists through exchange capacity building, co-creational activities and stimulating innovative and resilient urbanism in Havana. Um, they have created a lot of digital content and a digital platform uh, for exchange as well. There's so many components um, that it's a bit too much to go uh, into detail, but um, there's a strong uh, local ownership also of the project, which is um, important for us. And it's sort of connecting um, the technological terms uh, with, with the arts. One of the things they've done is that nine most, most, most avant-garde Cuban fashion and furniture brands have joined to create a joint collection, online collection called Global Warming, which um, is a really nice website that I would be happy to share with you um, with a focus on sustainable development and immersive experience. The collective has created an online virtual platform with a series of virtual talks with European designers and a live show under the category of immersive experience 
bringing together augmented reality, virtual reality, and 360 degree uh, video. Um, and so this is also, there's also the link uh, to the sustainable development goals, uh, working towards uh, more sustainable art uh, creation. Um, the third project that has been developed already under the auspices of the, uh, of the pandemic is taking place in Mexico. It's called Flash Act and it connects art, science and technology while also actually creating awareness of the SDGs, which is something that we've discussed recently in a workshop um, of ours, that there is so much potential for culture to sort of incorporate um, this global agenda um, from the beginning. Um, and I think there is a lot of um, sort of space to learn for us as the cultural sector. I mean, we've talked about um, the difficulty of reaching um, communities via digital means. And I think we have to ask ourselves the question if digital mobility is not is as limiting as lim mobility as we used to know it was and what we can do uh, to prevent that. Um, the, um, the project that I'm talking about here uh, they also reach out through to audiences via radio as uh, digital or the internet is not as mm, yeah as um, or the access to internet is quite limited in some of the areas of the countries that we're talking about here. Yeah, I'm, I'm and, sure you interrupt Gitip. We we shortly have to if we get to sum it up uh, very quickly because we are running out of time here. <laughs> um, we're already sure. 20 minutes over the time, so maybe we can just sum it up in a way, and then we can move on to the next speaker. Well, yeah, I mean, I talked briefly about all three projects. I'd be happy to share links um, so that uh, you can um, also educate yourself on on these. So, in any case, I think to sum up. Um, Digital projects are happening. They are they are creating um, spaces between cultural professionals and artists between the two um, two areas. And it's now to see uh, which ones are upscalable and which ones we sh for which ones we should go back to actually seeing each other. Yeah. So so thank you. And now um, not wasting any time. So over to Tony, uh, and you can share your thoughts as well. Thank you, Annette. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm I'm Tony. Uh, I live on an island, and this island happens to be a member state of the European Union. So you know you live between this dynamic of being small yet operate within a larger community. Um, and my intervention today is a reflection on my own experience as a lead author of Malta's national cultural policy. That's kind of stuck in between the pandemic. So think about this process whereby you have uh, a national process going on to develop a cultural policy around 2018, 2019. Suddenly the pandemic hits and there's a review of this cultural policy. And you're stuck in this kind of limbo on how do you actually shift the conversation or, or amend or adapt the reality, the pre-pandemic reality into a post-pandemic reality. Now, of course, the first cultural policy, uh, the, 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 the current draft really looks at digitization across board. And what I, what I would like to reflect upon is, is our national policy is really embedded. It really goes back to the roots of what I would identify as the roots of cultural policy. And that means cultural rights. Um, really embedded in the right to create, the right to engage, and the right to participate. Now, of course, you know, shifting from physical, in-person engagement, entering a museum, going to a library, going to a theater space, versus that digital transformation of experience, that is not just what we're talking about here. We're really talking about digitization and digitalization as a tool, but also as culture itself. And I think this is, this is very important. To, you know, we've spoken a lot today about, about the transformation that has engaged, that, that we engaged in because the tools were available or actually the lack of tools. But if we suddenly start thinking of digitalization as culture itself, how much is this going to change the narrative of uh, and the value proposition for culture? And let's be very honest, the past 12 months really have given us the opportunity to rethink 
about this value proposition for culture. You know, we are still living in a time when for most of us, digital engagement is the only show in, in town. You know, the only festival I can go to, the only performance I can see. Yet, we've mentioned some experiences today, some, some you know, let's not kid ourselves. You know, 40% of people in rural areas within the EU still do not have access uh, to, to broadband connections. Um, so if I had to shift this conversation back into the question in terms of how do we update our regulatory framework, first and foremost, cultural policy itself can be that regulatory framework. You know, but the problem with cultural policy is it tends to be late. It responds and it's not as agile as the industry itself. The digital means, you know, we're talking about non-fungible tokens right now. How many cultural policies are actually talking about this right now? Probably we'll see some cultural policies, you know, talk about this maybe this year, maybe next year. Until then, probably the market is either oversaturated and we are responding to regulate as opposed to create some form of framework that enables it to happen. So just to give you an idea in terms of how our cultural policy is currently looking at digitization across various levels. First and foremost, I would identify this um, primarily at implementation from a sectoral point of view. So, you know, there are specific measures that really address the needs of a particular subsector, like libraries, um, heritage, etc. But it also looks at digitization as a process to support participation. So, for example, if we're talking about active aging, if we're talking about um, uh, creative support for people with learning disabilities on how even artificial intelligence can actually support and improve access. But the, there are huge challenges ahead of us. You know, monetization, for example, of shifting this hybrid format is still relatively poor and very difficult to access and engage with. Probably a cultural policy cannot solve that problem as one member state. And as Monica has mentioned before, it requires collectivity from a regional and an international point of view. The other challenge we have, and this is also looked at at the cultural policy, is how do we enable and support also the artists to not just adapt, but be able to engage and shift into this conversation. I still come across a number of artists who find it very difficult to even understand how to develop this. And I think the most important thing is that we cannot think of digitalization as a replacement of. It's not about putting a show online. It's not about shifting your film experience to an online experience. We're talking about the creation of something new. Bring in artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and that kind of crossover of innovation and technology, which means that cultural policy on its own cannot achieve this. And this is where policymaking requires even more crossovers with economy, with technology, and with innovation. And I will stop there because there's a lot of more interventions for today. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for such a good energy and, and your, your, um, your very interesting thoughts as well here. Now I would uh, give five minutes to you, Natalie as well to share uh, her thoughts as well. Do we have Natalie here? You are. Sorry, it's that classic unmute uh, issue that we are experiencing in all sorts of Zoom panels. Um, thank you very much, of course, to the ULAC Foundation and my fellow panelists. Delighted to be here today to speak from a specifically Caribbean context, where I work as a museum director and cultural policy advisor to local government in the visual arts and creative industry sector, which of course have been dramatically transformed in the last 18 months. I'm also the former past president of MAC um, and here today from MAC's perspective um, as an association that has a very broad reach across the region um, with four major linguistic uh, membership areas and a range of institutions from very small community run museums to national cultural organizations like my own. Canvassing MAC members for the purposes of the presentation, it's been very clear that there is a huge uh, difference between digitization practices currently across the Caribbean. And despite the increase of digital projects that we've seen emerge in the pandemic, 
few formal policies or regulatory frameworks at the national scale. As Tony just mentioned, cultural policies are often late to catch up with what is being practiced on the ground. However, there are many exciting new models and frameworks that are emerging uh, from the region at the institutional or artist-led space level. Um, and I will speak more to this in just a moment. I think it's important as well to put into context the idea of cultural policy in the region. Not every country in the Caribbean has a national cultural policy. And even the ones that were implemented very recently, like my own in the Cayman Islands in 2017, Bermuda in 2019, I believe, and most recently Panama, who just launched their very first cultural policy in 2020. Many of those policies have very little, if any, reference to the digital realm beyond the classic sort of copyright, IP laws, or specific elements to strengthen uh, segments of the value chain. That is very different, of course, for countries like Barbados and Jamaica, who have invested very heavily in the creative industries. Currently, most of the cultural policies are looking at preservation of heritage and digitization of archives and libraries. Um, and of course, the, the um, uh, promotion of uh, security around the uh, creation of cultural goods in terms of IP. This, as we've mentioned, and we heard very much about the CAF statistics, is very um, uh, different in different countries, depending on access to the internet, uh, digital literacy. literacy. Um, and this is something that's impacted the Caribbean very, very heavily. And we've heard from members in organizations, countries like Haiti, Jamaica, uh, Cuba, having very, very limited access to the internet. Um, as mentioned, there are clear exceptions in terms of policy that's currently in practice. Um, Barbados in 2016 launched its Creative Industries Development Act. And this is currently supporting a new national digitization project that is being launched in 2020, 2021. Jamaica has also uh, really been at the forefront of developing national cultural policy around the creative economy and has just launched a very new revised policy with support from UNESCO's International Fund for Cultural Diversity. And that of course includes things like um, protecting artists, particularly their world-class music industry in the increasing uh, digitization age. And it's potentially a model that many of us within the region or internationally uh, can use uh, going forward, but it's too early to really assess um, the impact that it's having directly on the sector. The pandemic, of course, has profoundly transformed the way in which our communities create and access these digital cultural resources, as I've mentioned, highlighting the potential of them, but also the challenges around the digital divide. Um, MAC members canvassed in April 2020 really were responding very rapidly. Um, few of us in the region, I would say, have institutions with um, technical staff or staff that have digital expertise. So we've had to learn very rapidly um, through projects ranging from Zoom art classes, podcasts and YouTube, Facebook live stream panels to more technically sophisticated virtual museum tours, digitization of collections and expanded use of social media platforms. And it's been very important in our region that um, many of those are downloadable instead of stream content due to that digital um, challenge with access. Um, Many of our institutions have rapidly tried to keep up in terms of developing our own internal policies around IP, um, processing, collecting, and preserving digital data, as well as working directly with communities um, with shared content. Um, and just a couple of samples that I would like to share very quickly. And again, I can share links to these after the presentation. Um, again, best practice at the artist-led or institutional level. Um, National Gallery of Bermuda have just launched a new program called Tracing Our Roots, which is an entirely digital project that invites Bermudians to explore and honor their family histories through the museum's digital archive. What is particularly innovating about this is their training initiatives that they're rolling out for the community um, in order to get a better understanding of how to share video content, how to scan archival documents, and how to store those documents as well with a fully digitized program. There's also the Virtual Museum of Caribbean Migration and Memory, which is a ULAC Museums Horizon 2020 project in partnership with the Barbados Museum and Historical Society and the University of the West Indies. 
And this combines physical and digital exhibitions in a hybrid model, as Gita mentioned, which has great potential going forward. And it offers audience accessibility um, to previously undocumented stories and resources in a way that we've, we've never seen before in the region or rarely seen. The archiving system is designed to be integrated across several platforms. And I think this would be a potential model um, for growing uh, across the region, but of course, in a bi-regional sense as well. And then just quickly, I wanted to include the Catapult Caribbean Arts Programme because this is an artist-led programme rather than an institutional initiative developed by the Artist Residency Project Fresh Milk Barbados and Creative Kingston um, during lockdown. It's an entirely digital experience with a multi-part programme that includes virtual artist residencies, curator artist talks, professional development and skill um, practical rollout for artists, as well as an e-publication to archive the entire project. And it included writers, curators, and artists from 20 different Caribbean countries. Because several of these projects exist outside of national borders and policy frameworks, even though those are limited, the ones that are in place, all have had to develop initiatives that consider these multiple linguistic challenges, geographical challenges, and different legal frameworks that they exist in. Um, I think they've done a fantastic job. And again, these are organizations that we can all learn from. So just to wrap up, um, we are catching up in terms of formal national policy frameworks. There will be a lot of work to do in response to the rapid transformation that we've seen in the last 18 months. And it gives us uh, amazing opportunities for breaking down some of the barriers that we have in the region, both in terms, as mentioned, linguistic, geographical, um, social, um, but specifically from different learning points as well. But it's also highlighted, as mentioned, the severe challenges that we have in terms of digital literacy and access to both broadband and uh, equipment. So there is an urgent need um, at a regional and national level to start addressing some of these and specifically looking at things like equitable access to digital internet services, monetization, as we referenced earlier, of digital culture to ensure appropriate remuner remuneration for artists. Um, and a more collaborative approach to multi-stakeholder policy making that includes the practitioners and the government uh, policy makers. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, now we have just five minutes left with our translator, but, but, uh, but we still have one more uh, person to share their expertise. So Clementine, um, the floor is yours and, and you can share your expertise. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Annette. It's very difficult to come last after all these uh, very interesting presentations and, uh, and reflections and practices. So I will try to be brief also to um, mention that my experience has been in research and projects uh, almost exclusively in Europe. So I really have this uh, uh, this background and, and this is where I come from. And this is why also the examples I will share are a bit based in this geographical area, but I also will bring uh, some other example from, from Latin America, uh, which I encountered recently. Um, just also to, to follow up on, on the previous um, the previous presentations and the previous remarks, I think uh, we have mentioned various elements of uh, what makes the a digital cultural policy or cultural policies adapted to uh, digitization of society. And just briefly to recall some terms I've heard uh, from uh, the previous speakers, I think it was mentioned quite a lot, the uh, term of accessibility, uh, so diversity, inclusion, uh, gender and maybe something that has been less mentioned, but I think would be interesting to look uh, further in the future is sustainability. I mean, it has been mentioned, but also the uh, digital uh, carbon footprint of digital cultural activities is also something to uh, to look and research more in details. Um, so yeah, I would like to, to reflect on these different terms and how they can be embedded in some uh, practices in some frameworks. Um, I think Monica summed up very well what the EU is doing in terms of uh, digital cultural policies and uh, especially is the programs and the projects the EU is funding. And these programs and projects provide some inter interesting cases uh, of reflection and experimentation on digitization that can also later inform uh, the policy making because yeah, as, as Tony uh, and Natalie said, the cultural policy is very uh, 
often catching up with what is happening on the field. Um, so I will be very brief. I wanted to, to mention a couple of examples. Uh, so first, firstly, one that reflects on what digitization means for society, what it means as a cultural thing, as a cultural transformation, and how artists are also navigating this space. Um, and there is a project that we, uh, we at KEA are involved in, which is called Arts Formation, and I can put the link in the chat uh, later. Um, it's a Horizon 2020 project, so it's a research project, but it also has some residency component. And what it does is it, that it tries to understand and to analyze the ways in which uh, the arts uh, can reinforce the, the social, the, the cultural, and the economic and the political benefits, if any, <laughs> of digital transformation. And, and they are and the artists are very much exploring this field in their creative ways so um, what we are looking at in this project is what the role what is the role of the arts in uh, in digital society so there is a series of research uh, papers um, and how also how the civil society mobilized the arts to catalyze the, the social impact and the social change and the participation in the digital transformation uh, and finally, we have a, a policy aspect of how the arts can inform and can shape this uh, digital or the, digi the regulation in the digital uh, society and how they can um, bring uh, their views and their perceptions and maybe their future looking um, creations in the legislative, in the policy making uh, framework for, for the digital transformation. So this is one uh, very exploratory, let's say, project that is currently developing uh, and also developing as a project in the digital realm because we have been working on this for one year so we really started uh, at the same time as the lockdown uh, so we are really working digital there is a series of podcasts if you're interested and some papers have already been published but this is uh, more something to follow up for for the future um, in terms of other experiments that have been uh, funded uh, by the EU. Uh, I wanted to mention one that can be quite interesting considering our, uh, our times of physical distancing and not being able to gather in, uh, inside theaters or inside uh, museums or, um, or cinemas is the use of the public space as a cultural space and how uh, digital tools can help uh, taking uh, the, the public space outdoors. And there was an interesting experiment. And again, I will, I will share, be happy to share the link uh, in the chat, um, an experiment in, in Berlin, uh, which is, which is uh, about graffitis and how uh, the uh, cali what they call calligraphy can help some uh, groups, maybe marginalized groups that they work with migrants, for instance, to express their feelings and express their uh, art artistic creation on the walls being uh, broadcasted, uh, screened on, on big walls. So there is this, uh, this interesting uh, experiment where uh, we use the digital tool to take the public space as a cultural space and also to give a voice to groups which are maybe uh, further off the, the traditional, let's say, cultural offer. So there's been a number of, of experiments with this technique. Um, in Europe, but also uh, doing this in collaboration with other spaces. For instance, they have replicated this uh, this experiment in, in Hong Kong. Uh, so um, there is also this aspect of how the digital tool can uh, bring people together from different parts of the world. And this is also uh, why we are here today all together. So this is more of a, an application, let's say, of uh, digital um, digitization in culture. Um, and since I have very, very little time, I will just jump, really take awesome. a very big jump uh, into more of a, a macro view. And of course, I think, uh, I, I don't know, but I'd be really happy to learn if there is any fully encompassive cultural digital policy that takes all these aspects I mentioned in the introduction into account. Um, I think we have very interesting experiments. And one thing I wanted to mention also uh, in the frame of this uh, EU LAC uh, webinar is an, an interesting attempt to take also digital into account when making strategies or laws for uh, the cultural and creative sectors. I had the opportunity uh, last year to be involved in a seminar from the 
ESTAP in Colombia, so the uh, uh, Superior School for Public Administration, and I had to look at uh, their culture and creative law, which is the Ley Naranja, for those who are familiar with that. And it's quite interesting that digital aspects are mentioned in a number of um, of sub chapters, let's say, um, whether at the level of the infrastructure um, and how to uh, consolidate the digital infrastructure for the dissemination of cultural content at the level of institutions as well, at the level of cultural entrepreneurship and how to empower cultural entrepreneurs to use digital tools. So if you're interested more in the legislative and regulation aspect, uh, this is a, an interesting example to, to look at. Um, so yeah, this uh, I, I am aware uh, this uh, is very like a lot of information in a very short time. So I think just as a conclusion, what I think is important now nowadays, and and especially with the pandemic. Um, effects on the cultural and creative sector is to really grasp what digital means across the whole cultural and creative value chain from the creation to the marketing the distribution the audience development and i think that is what uh, cultural policy uh, should should look at it was mentioned as well uh, earlier by previous panelists the, the remuneration and the fair remuneration of artists and cultural operators in the digital sphere is of course a very burning point and finally, um, the inclusive and the democratic uh, digital territories uh, for uh, a, a wider and a more inclusive access and literacy uh, across the digital, um, across digital tools and digital uh, cultural experiences uh, is also an element to, to take into account in, in policy making. So yeah, that is my very short contribution to this uh, panel. I'm very sorry that we had to rush you, but we really have to cut off now. Um, so what I wanted to say to my side, first of all, is a very big thank you for everyone who have contributed to this webinar today. I think it was very interesting to hear from different like views and, and expertise here. Um, and, and all of your questions will be answered in, in specific details in our reports as well that we will send out to all of the participants once again here. And now I would give the floor back to you, Dr. Bonilla, uh, who is going to just um, sum it up with uh, his closing remarks here. But from my side, a very big thank you to everyone uh, for, for joining in today here. And I, and I too sincerely hope that this was also something interesting for you today. You are muted, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Annette. Uh, this seminar aimed to provide a space for dialogue and presentation of challenges, as well as promising initiatives at the level of cultural policies in Latin America and the Caribbean and the European Union. It offered, I think, a brief balance of the similarities and the differences between the two regions in terms of the digitization and its implications for digital cultural policies. The seminar also addresses a number of challenges and opportunities uh, associated uh, with cultural policies, especially in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have identified several challenges. Uh, due to the highly differentiated access to the media and technological knowledge, there is a risk that geographical, social and economic gaps will wither even more. Gender divisions, on the other hand, have also been found in the area of access and uh, to the use of uh, new technologies. There is a risk also of uh, losing uh, diversity, taking into account that a very high percentage of digital content is being presented in a very small number of languages. Alterations in the way of art and culture production have an impact on value changes with significant questions about the remuneration, the salaries of cultural managers and producers. Among the opportunities perhaps the following stand out, uh, the necessary increase in public investment to guarantee infrastructure and accessibility to increase uh, uh, the access to new technologies in the internet. 
uh, it is also relevant to promote visibility of the market to enhance the role of artists as creators and distributors of, of, of culture. Uh, and the importance of the design of comprehensive and lasting cultural strategies and policies appropriate uh, to this new scenario uh, is uh, something that we have to think of. I would like to conclude this event by thanking the support of the co-chairs of the Gulag Foundation. Also I, uh, also, I want to reiterate uh, our gratitude to the government of Hamburg and particularly to the Secretary of State, Olmud uh, Miller, thanks to our great moderator, Annette Numa, and to the panelists, to all the panelists. And finally, I would like to ask to help us. Along with the access to the webinar, we received a very small survey that will help us to evaluate our production and to improve future initiatives. We ask you kindly to fill it out. Muchas gracias y hasta pronto.